Hello everyone, today we talk about Crusaders, Outremer and Romanian warfare, covering essentially the say, military fundamentals, mostly from the influences um, received also from the surrounding cultures in arms and armor of the Crusader states in Syria, Palestine, Cyprus, but also the um, territories comprised by the so-called Latin Empire of Constantinople and also its successors in Greece that, as you know, sort of lived on even after uh, the the Byzantines reconquered essentially Constantinople at the end of the 13th century. So there is a lot of stuff, um, as you understand, we can't simply summarize, like I already made something about the Latin Empire. Uh, we talked a lot, of course, about um, uh, Levantine warfare during the Crusades, and not just also from the take the Crusader side, like we began to see in a substantially say interesting way at least uh, Seljuk, Ubud uh, warfare, etc. And there is, um, of course, lots more of it incoming today. We just make sort of brainstorming, sort of you know general evaluation, then looking at um, the panoplies of the. Western um, knights mostly, because that's also the, the kind of, um, let's say, a, um, fire type that mostly get. Yeah, there is also a lot of other stuff next to them, but uh, in that sense, also as a as the development, think about the Turkopoles of certain practice, at least with certain tactics, certain uh, military outlook that had um, uh, that was the adaptation to that kind uh, of, of world. Um, and admittedly, we never talked, so I'd say I would have liked to, to discuss more structurally um, the history, for example, of the Crusader states in Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, uh, with the arrival of the First Crusade uh, in 1098. Uh, strategically speaking, I believe that there was a much greater potential in this Levantine um, dom dominions than it, it's both assessed. Like this, this the fetistic um, attitude towards oh, but the the, the Ottoman states were weak. Um, the they were surrounded by uh, larger forces. The had to fall. This is actually not true. Especially if you look at the Kingdom of Jerusalem, you realize that that you know the that state was really a compact thing. Things, of course, went uh, badly. Um, at some point, we talk about, um, uh, say, the, the general demise of the of uh, the years of limited power from Hatton to Acre. We talk also about our ultramar states. Uh, we observed, of course, the uh, the demise of the same. Uh, the uh, say that the fall of Acre opens to the uh, one. Uh, of the remaining crusader-held coastal centers into uh, the Mamluk hands. Uh, although the Templars in particular would remain in possession of the offshore island of Arbad until 1303, and there is actually still a lot of involvement of the Westerners in, in Levan, all right, and not just in the Crusades, to Smyrna, for example, but in the very interaction, for example, with the Armenians who held out uh, against the Mamluks for, for a longer time, there is an interesting level of mercenarism around that actually uh, continues also with a lot of Western elements and or influence, also in arms and armor, so it's really a complex picture. Um, from the other side, we see uh, in Greece the uh, crusader so-called Empire of Romania, based upon Constantinople, uh, lasting, as we were saying, from the Fourth Crusade in 1204 and the Palaiologan Reconquest in 1261. You have the Crusader principalities in southern Greece that uh, survive uh, into the 15th century, uh, so falling in some cases only uh, to the Ottoman onslaught. We made some videos recently, including the one about the Battle of Pelagonia that sort of illustrates that uh, that reality, and we have to discuss these principalities a bit more. Uh, also, the Kingdom of Cyprus was uh, 
you know, a Christian crusader um, polity uh, uh, lasting, like against also the the attempts of the Mamluks to take over the island, which was uh, taken over, by the way, by the Venetians in 1489, and so technically sort of lost the, lost the sense of um, uh, also inheritance of uh, inheritance rights that connected with Jerusalem that however was also something claimed by other uh, rulers up there, the ones of Naples the Burgundians and, and more right, and that uh, say the Venetians were sort of more pragmatic uh, to a certain degree, but they would lose again as you know Cyprus to the to the Turks uh, later on uh, as you understand it's too big of a history to just be too specific about which is true even just for the essentials of their warfare all right there is the idea that the crusader states of Ultramare would have been small and vulnerable right um cyprus and the fact that it's also held out for a bit longer but there was actually an island we can't quite compare it in terms of power to, for example the, the kingdom of jerusalem it, everything is debatable uh, at least would have been affected by such condition in their military development. Um, this, if true, depended mostly on the fact that there weren't too many Europeans that were so interested in the Levant just per se, especially in terms of, say, military uh, settlement as colonists, right, the interland was, was sort of dangerous, right? So one thing is holding the uh, the Portugal citadels, which is something that, of course, made a lot of sense, and actually the, the Crusades are, you know, people make a huge deal of that because, you know, the 20th century has obsessed them at least in a certain direction, fundamentally against religion. But, say, nobody says, ah, the Romans should have not conquered Syria or, or, or Judea. Um, that they were the ones changing, like, uh, just to make a, an offense to the Jews into into Palestine um, uh, after the Philistines, but that, in fact, just, like, how unfounded, for that matter, any other Palestinian mentality really is. Um, also, they descend normally from, from Jews if, that inhabited, once upon a time, those places in, say, in larger um, quantity uh, than these times. And the sense is that, um, you know, you would have, the, the, if anything, a problem in having a political unity in the connection of this Ultramar state, which was reflected by the same political fragmentation of Europe at the time. And Europe had a lot of things going on within it, right, with an internal expansion that, of course, also reached this um, the, the Levant, but that sort of makes a lot of sense. It's not some strange of adventure, especially structuralist historians began to say, I don't know, the only um, the only thing that the Crusaders won out, out of, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Ultramar uh, adventure was apricot, right? It sort of doesn't make sense, right? For centuries, they had this capacity of, you know, controlling the area, profiting from that, like, connecting it further, as it, they would be remaining connected anyway through um, mainly the Italian trade uh, with Europe. Um, so, also from a military point of view, there is a lot of forgotten stuff, of course, this, this is concerned, we've seen it, for example, in the armament of, of I don't know, the, the Mamluks, the, the idea that there was always a sort of strong influence in this, and this Levant, from uh, from the west, right? It's pretty much any area uh, at that uh, at that point. Um, the quality of the Crusader states' uh, forces was also good, telling the truth. Like this was true just for the first expedition in the first place, and also later on, right? We do not see uh, Crusaders uh, having sort of you know material problems when it came to the way they fought if anything they they adapted probably to some some lighter type of warfare so we can say just because of many reasons the type of enemies the weather etc but we do not have any evidence of backwardness or whatever actually westerners had some hell of of um of technology already that they were bringing uh there We'll see now the debate, because lots of historians, including, for example, Nicole, that really wrote a lot about this stuff, 
like have, remain obsessed with some sort of connection right with with the east um which is fine but uh, that really makes you rise um an eyebrow when you know the idea is that allegedly you know like the technological boom of of the west would have been connected with the crusades the contact with these other peoples when you realize actually that they had been developing the thing under all um all along and that more or less this cultures the westerners the 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 byzantines the, the the muslims were at that point sort of a you know parallel civilizations i mean they had especially in a material sense um like pretty much the, the same level of development and if you have to search for actually for some more advanced one after this point or a decade of studying medieval warfare i start to 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 evident from from quite some time like that i can't see how the the easterners would have been more developed than the westerners in that still balanced um uh, still at that balanced level in any case um there was likely some uh, other issue connected with the aforementioned lack of enthusiasm for the the Ultramar enterprise for example the shortage of horses uh, the very expensive war horses that were as you know the bit like the cornerstone of the western uh, shock uh, cavalry charge um this was surely the case in the early years there were some monastic orders such as especially the um the cartusians that uh would um would actually specialize in horse breeding also to like uh for military purposes to export uh this mount to to the holy land um it's possible however that these connections would have um still laid under a general say lack of replicability of those resources in loco in the lab band and so a bit like keep sending aid right because we really need that but we do not have such overwhelming evidence of this if anything the problem was again a shortage of manpower uh, this was serious but it was definitely exaggerated by the earlier generations of historians um that also tended to make the point that is completely um moderate compared by the way to islamic historiography that the crusader military personnel would have been particularly outnumbered by in fact enormous uh, numbers of islamic forces that however are like considered um uh especially in the organic as it's described in a still realistic way right you could say i don't know there were 15,000 Christians and there were I don't know 30,000 Turks right it's not so strange if you know and we've seen it often like what the actual organization of those armies was really about the fact that the westerners were fewer also because they concentrated uh, more wealth into the single um into the single soldiers by training armament um and also heaviness which could be a problem in this kind of battles but that also seemingly has nothing to do with an alleged you know um deficit or say incapacity to cope with this eastern tactics just by the fact that they relied mostly on those faint flights and this again um distance like harassment etc by themselves were saying that they didn't have the shock um say capacity as a central uh, nucleus right to simply destroy um by say smashing the, the 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 western forces on average right and so that you had to recur as in all battles between again very similar peoples at this point on you know the the say command morale just fortune and and whatever happens and there are many instances of actually west typically western forces that are able to put to flight um realistically larger amounts of turks that were not even that speedier as it seems um it's just um you have to take the time to study uh the whole thing which 
has not been done in such great detail, right? Greater attention is being given mostly to the initial conquest and first expansionist century than the second defensive phase, uh, which is also fascinating because, again, the, the latter doesn't mean um, that things were getting worse in quality. If anything, it's likely that the, the first crusade achieved more in conditions of, of greater material primitivity uh, also compared to the to the to the locals uh, to, to the local foes than the uh, later crusader defeat in the Levant, right so it's it's never that obvious never as always even be fooled by the the, the chronologistic bias you know how it ended evidently uh, speaking of greece like that's different really different world romania was definitely more appealing than at the Levant, right, was a greater cultural and religious uh, affinity. We don't have to think that the Crusaders being particularly sensitive people from a human point of view, it's pretty much like the entire world I was at that point, but they had a very san strong sense of, of hierarchy, of, again, of necessity was imposing their feudal system. It wasn't, again, the, also the, the, the recipe for failure, some structuralist said, I don't know, you know, uh, feudalism was bad, was wrong, could never work in, uh, in in the Levant or in Greece because these were different peoples. Yes, of course, but in fact there were differences in the, the ways this in, was implemented. Like the Westerners did not come um, there with this preconceived notion of we have to replicate 100% whatever we have in Western Europe because nobody knows why, like in the history of I don't know, of technology or economics or whatever, they were actually clever in adapting without mentioning that, as we've seen, and we'll have, we have some videos actually incoming on all these various topics, uh, incidentally, the same cultures, think about the Komnenian world, like just before, like the, the Fourth Crusade, um, had been, uh, had gone under a, an important uh, process of, essentially proto-feudalization uh, that was not just about the, the privatization of the system like the erosion of public culture but the literal settlement of western mercenaries as vassals all across the, the Byzantine Empire and this was going on by the way from quite a while and um, it, it, it is sort of this, the reason why also the system sort of collapsed in many ways was subsumed by different means, but um, through different means, by the same Westerners, and um, the fall of uh, the Byzantine Empire in 1204 is also sort of a proof of this. Just like like the the foothold that the Crusaders maintained for a couple of centuries in um, uh, in in the Levant, right? We will of course distinguish in other videos better between the two environments here we focus mostly on sort of the crusader military technicalities of the story um, the military orders as you know so the, the templars the hospitalers were quite deeply connected with the uh, ultramar world they had been born there also the teutonic knights in origin etc this place had been the um, the one in which orders of any kind that had been existing, we have seen this often also in the history of, of Christianity, took on that military character, a bit like they would in the Reconquista and or like the Teutonic Knights and sort of other um, similar ones that relocated in the Baltic uh, with the spread also of others. So these were all sort of militarized um, um, situations different from one another but still like n requiring this sort of more military control you know that these um, monastic military orders especially in, in the Holy Land but actually in all of these I would have like almost a, a constitutively um, essential role of defense like if you took away like the um, the Templars or the Hospitaliers from from the Levant, basically the backbone of the local armies would have um, disappeared, and so like um, the the latter uh, collapsed. Right, so there was a true 
devotion to God and to the the cause of holding the holy places that was deeply felt actually by by Christendom at, at the time, even when again there was a shortcoming in the defense of those very provinces. This is a bit like what we see today. Like there there may be uh, some uh, resistance, some laziness, some sort of uh, inertia. Um, but in all of this, there was undoubtedly a great mix of especially material culture and uh, tactical practice um, that fit well, that again, basic level of homogeneity that brought like the sort of more structured elements of the armies to behave tendentially in a way or another adapting to the context and um, this is actually a frontier of historiography all to explore still because I think that yes there have been great names um, but um, let's say covering in especially in the say, icono from the, uh, the iconographic side of the story like the matter but especially uh, battles and their diachronic and comparative analysis um, escape keeps uh, escaping a little bit like the normal uh, historical practice and I think that we can understand much better how these um, peoples fought especially there with one another much better through obviously the uh, the battle accounts than single um, say works of art that can be also very very stylistic in some cases. Um, so of course that still needs to be done uh, and I, as you know, specialize essentially in that craft, but I, I do it for some sort of smaller and um, it's actually much better documented and for that reason still not dealt with paradoxically um, region uh, of Europe but you know that on Schwerpunkt as we were recalling before, we also covered lots of crusader battles and quite interesting things emerged from those uh, as well and so at Major, let's say um, the crusaders adopted ideas, items of equipment from their Islamic foes and there is no doubt the other way around is also true um, the, the question were these actual responses or copies sort of doesn't make much sense. I mean, if you go to, to a place in which, of course, they fight in a certain manner, you sort of adapt to, to those. And, and these, even if they are responses, meaning that they didn't need to specifically adapt or, or even like adopt, for that matter, um, some sort of devices, some certain practices from their foes from just the locals that at some point would fight in fact together with the same you understand how blended the thing is um, this doesn't mean that um, you know they're sort of revolutionary ideas they're sort of very obvious practical solutions that derive from also pretty universal tactical needs depending on how the, the various factors are balanced All right. uh, we see things like I don't know, light cavalry using light spears were reed or bamboo halves, which was historically like an Arab thing since the, the early days of Islam, if not um, before, of course, um, the region, as far as the spread at least of, of the Bedouins. Um, you see a lot of mounted infantry, which may have corresponded rather to a strategic need of having uh, high speed raiding forces, um, uh, like it happened, if you think about the caravans. Um, caravan routes that were regularly attacked it was a type of warfare it was much more frontier like it's sort of you know borderline you know that in the interland at some point there is the desert as well so it's a very different frontier from the one with the stamp or and or with i don't know the, the celtic fringe it's, it's another story right also spain is is, is quite different there are some similarities to an extent but um some aspects are also unique uh, we see infantry archers apparently having a greater uh, role in, in the Western armies, naturally for what, can you guess? Of course, countering, um, especially Turkic archery and that kind of, again, light, lighter, more missile-based type of warfare was typical of the area. Like, it's just like 
I don't know, in Eastern Europe or the Balkans, this, this was the case. We've seen all these areas, by the way, in parallel, in parallel to, to this, and we've seen how also interconnected with, as far as these others, really, they were geographically, militarily, um, politically. Um, there is a general success, also, the Western forces against, say, Fatimid Arab um, horse archers, um, the Armenians, too, had a lot of that. We talk about Armenian warfare. So as far as the Cilician, not just the Caucasian one, uh, is concerned, uh, most of these people also fought into each other's armies uh, on a regular basis, in a uh, numerically significant way. So there's no surprise whatsoever. Um, the... This, this is yet another idea that the, the Crusaders would have um, learned to make a more effective use of infantry um, so that when you look at Western European development in terms of infantry, that should be a, a consequence of the Crusades. Um, I honestly, I, stud, I studied for a lot of time and in some depth the history of European infantry during these very centuries and I can say that there is no trace of evidence that this can be even pointed out like as a as an objective datum right there is nothing properly like it, it, it may be an hypothesis in the sense that everything may be until you you know demonstrate it but um like there are all the political military and social preconditions for the westerners to have actually much tougher infantry that they had always had compared to the to the eastern one so um the, this idea would come from a gross un, under um, say exaggeration and probably misunderstanding of, of the role of heavy cavalry in the West. Like it's not in the West, say infantry was unknown or there were there weren't sort of advanced developed infantry tactics. Hell, there were, right? And especially also in countries that very 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 close, very close and also protagonistic. As far as the Ultramar was concerned, the French, the Italians. Um, so this is actually true also for for. Central, say, Europe in general, like the continent uh, as such. This was true since uh, ancient times. So um, this is not a video to criticize uh, this idea at, at length, right? Um, but the idea is that since um, the Byzantines or the Fatimid Arab systems were historically, uh, also because they had less heavy cavalry, from a quantitative point of view, the Westerners having, in fact, so being that force being released in at some other level, including having I don't know larger amounts of infantrymen, people said, "Oh, look, you know, maybe the Crusaders fought like that because they, um, they they were imitating these guys." And it is true in the sense that if that was the balance, of course, when they, the the Crusaders conquered Syria or Palestine, they the locals vote in those ways, and the militias that tech normally making up the the infantry base would have voted in that way. But look at in this centuries, I don't know, Italian infantries, and of course there is no connection um, in terms of like the development probably of the estates that provided with that top notch infantry force. It was also very effective during the Crusades, by the way, and any. Uh, connection with the same. If anything, it had been these guys that had even allowed fundamentally to go uh, to the Crusades in a in a strategical sense and contributing also with um, incredibly advanced technology um, already. Um, and there is a debate regarding I don't know, maybe like in the time of uh, say the Islamic domination of the Mediterranean, these areas had been also more influenced. Why do you have to reduce that to te technology? Right, if an area has, is very rich um, in, in per capita wealth, literally, and in technological development, and literacy, and public culture, and uh, civic uh, identity, etc., why wouldn't you expect there to normally always have there been strong infantry? As we also know that they existed from before, and and, and actually looking at the, the same local Byzantine, say, Fatimid. Um, Warfare. It's not that these infantries were this much compared to the Western ones at this point at all. Like actually, we do not have any evidence 
that they were as tough, as uh, trained, as armored, uh, as heavy, proper as, as the Western one. So uh, that's also no, right? We've seen it in many videos about the same uh, Frankish warfare in the Holy Land and mostly against, admittedly, the Turks that instead made at least a poor use of infantry, even though they, they also ruled in these places, so requiring that militia service, um, but that do not really have, even just, again, politically or civically as communities, that the same consistency of, of the Western ones. But absolutely, right? there's no evidence, historiographic, nobody ever even came up with that, for that matter. And this is the problem of sticking too much to oh look uh, on this uh, you know wall you have uh, a guy with a weapon that sort of looks like the one that we saw somewhere else like is that can, can that be um, uh, a reliable uh, systemic indicator of the, the broader civilizational development considering the overwhelming uh, amount of evidence at any other political, military, and social level that we already very well know of, right? Unfortunately, this is... That's why I hate Nicole, honestly. I mean, I actually love the guy. He made a lot of um, great work, but he sort of overly stressed this thing. And I actually have a video incoming exactly on uh, central northern Italian warfare that... Um, um, he uh, said it had a lot of this infantry aspects of and there are, there's an important uh, military development. There are some parallels with, with the, for example, as far as the Middle East, with some similar armor. With the same, and the guy at that point cannot even say, well, I don't know, this is maybe just uh, what you can say for the Khazars or for the Rus at some point in their history. Like, there is no connection between um, Italy and those places, and he always uses the conditional. Um, and not to admit that, again, different peoples may have the same development, and you also must understand that, uh, say, of specific uh, types of arms and armor, shields and whatever, and that even though context existed at the commercial level, at the cultural level, like, um, these, um, say, the local context is always overwhelmingly more important for the development and implementation of a technology than the contact. Of course, everybody in the world knew what, whatever idea was out there in Eurasia. I mean, you had, I don't know, Arab artillery specialists that went uh, to China from centuries. Um, but that, does this simply mean that, I don't know, the, the Chinese needed the Arabs to develop their own artillery? That's not exactly how the thing really worked. And here you even lack the evidence with, that is instead countered by an overwhelming Western push so towards the east, the control of the Mediterranean, etc. Right. Um, but getting also to the Middle Eastern influence, because people also confuse like the Near East with the Middle East. It's something like Syria, are saying, or I don't know, Egypt. It's uh, maybe not Egypt, but say, say in fact, the Levant. It's mid the Middle East. No, the Middle East starts from Mesopotamia, fundamentally east. Right. It reaches until like uh, places like Persia and barely beyond. Um, and um, you you don't mix the two things also because they were different um, at a core level like the in fact the Levant also Egypt this um, that controlled most of the former in fact um, was sort of much more um, sanitary right urbanized or more east, more Western looking telling the truth well the Middle East had been hegemonized by the Turks, um, you know, they, they had been heavily persified. It was always Iran that made the lion's share culturally, and etc. But it truly, really, in fact, was mu much more privatized, much more feudalized, much more also cavalry based for that matter. And so, yes, in Syria, you've, especially, there is a lot of um, interesting militias. I have a video in coming for the military historical unit times about the Syrian infantrymen at the time. Egypt also had good um, forces of that kind, where some also mercenaries, some Sudanese infantry they were very tough. At some point, it withstood even you know Western cavalry charges, showing that actually even the most primitive of peoples in certain circumstances, if morally loaded, can achieve a lot. To, uh, a great punch in the face when anyone thinks that technology is, is the answer. I have actually an, uh, yet another video, yet another military historical unit series about the um, sub-Saharian 
mercenaries in places like um, Spain, um, North Africa, Sicily uh, at the same time. And that overlaps also with another. You will see. You will see. Because we have to cover still a lot of different areas uh, yet. And they are important exactly to dimension better um, these ones. But speaking of the Middle Eastern influences, um, there's no doubt that the Crusaders at some point adopted, for example, the Yazara. It doesn't mean that it was like the standard armor, but you do find using them. This was a lined or padded male hauberk, and the idea, this is also very debatable, is that uh, we don't see much padding uh, from ancient um, times. Uh, in the West, there actually was. Um, but let's say this design at least like seemingly was much more similar to the in fact the Middle Eastern Yazaran than um than else. Um also the idea that the counterweight trebuchet would have been like a eastern um uh, let's say uh, thing that the West just copied and passively like and doesn't actually uh, sounds very credible in the first place, also because, well, you're statically speaking, there weren't many other ways you could um, make artillery at the time. We'll perhaps talk about this, and I have nothing coming, but it's, it's still so very, yes, it's a very advanced technology for the time. It's, it's great, in fact, how to see how as advanced as peoples were, they, they had this stuff, um, and they could do it without like in the moment in which it, it appears, you already know that the civilization had been ready for that from from some time at least, right? And everything seems to appear in parallel. And so even trying to, to trace where is the first time you find this, it's rather, you know, look at how often was it used and why also the, the considering the political and social reality at the time. Um, uh, Europe has a level of fortification, for example, that, substantially surpasses the wall region at that point um, of we're looking today. Um, so there are these other, for example, Islamic, Byzantine, or Central Asian influences as far as scale-lined or laminated coat of plates were there. What would become essentially the bassinet helmet as well, protecting the back and sides of the head. That's a design we've seen existing, at least iconographically, um, among many different regions before they would become the sort of more typical, um, say, later medieval type of helmet. So what do we have to think? That nobody had ever thought of making a helmet of that shape? Like, there aren't so many ways you can make a helmet. There's lots, so many ways you can make a shield or whatever, in any case. Um, uh, some have put uh, forward the idea that, for example, m movable visors on a helmet, uh, things like separate gauntlets would have also been an Eastern influence, but there isn't actually, I think, any evidence to to suggest that this was actually the case. Uh, surely what is interesting is how different peoples in this much more sort of ethnically composite area than than Europe was, um, may have played in this um, sort of exchange uh, of technology. For example, the Armenians were very active also in Crusader armies. They may have maintained connections with the Caucasus, with other peoples. We, we do find really a lot going on with, uh, again, armor that looks even Russian, right, in some places of the Levant. And we do know, think about through the Mamluks, how many sort of, how much movement of of slave soldiers, etc., existed, and how blended actually the area was from an ethnic point of view. Um, we find the aforementioned Armenians as a valuable source of mercenaries for the Crusader states of Syria. Um, they were by far the most influent Eastern Christian group as far as uh, warfare was concerned, so because as you know, they were quite warlike and they, um, they were also dangerous at some point fighting against the crusaders at some point like everybody fought against any other of these groups including uh, some crusaders align themselves with some muslims fight to fight other crusaders a similar thing like also from the islamic side um 
I made a video from the military historical unit series about the Turquopoles that, as you know, is a Greek term because still the Byzantine-ness and uh, uh, in its cultural influence is very strong in many of these areas, which simply means Turkish children of the Turks in practice. And these would be, uh, the, in theory, like those... Uh, people of Turkish descent that were understood in Levant that, as you know, did not have ethnic Turks in a historical sense, like um, the children of some soldiers and mercenaries, as the Seljuks had been, um, and or at least some rulers, some people who had, um, for example, a, could be considered even as military colonists or somebody that was settled in some forms of vassalage, right, such as the Ikta system. Right, and later on, the term Turkopol came to identify just instead a type of fighting that was in fact the historical horse archery of the Turks that sometimes was carried out by the same crusaders. I mean, there were people I don't know, born and raised in in, in Belgium that um, went going to the crusaders, say squires, etc., learned how to fight as horse archers, following their masters in the, the same way. Um, there were Greeks that, um, say, especially after the Crusaders conquered Constantinople, like, there was a major crisis locally that went on fighting as Turkopoles, even maybe in mm, Far East, uh, in this, within still this, this uh, regional scale. Um, so, there were Turkopoles that were also infantrymen, for that matter. Uh, it's that varied. Uh, we've seen how there was probably an, almost an in institutionalized military uh, service in Cyprus of this kind of forces that could be, again, technically anyone. Um, we see a, a certain Byzantine Mamluk style in the, especially in the archery of the land path, right, that you can palpate also within the, the Crusader ranks at some point. Um, however, not in that more nomadic Central Asian Turkic fashion that the Seljuks were more famous for. Again, the, the Levant is much more sanitary, is much more urban, is much more. Again, they had had the Roman Empire. I mean, let's be honest. That also that the, the radical divide with uh, with the Persian um, influenced East instead. And so it was sort of closer to Europe in, in many ways. You know that the Egyptians had sort of more shock cavalry, more infantry. And so their armies, um, at this point, even when fighting against the Crusaders, were sort of more similar to to, to the, their foes than, say, the, the Seljuk ones. We see Turkopoles, as we were saying before, in Cyprus, um, the Balkan and or Greek world of, of Romania, right? And perhaps even in Normandy, after the return of Richard of England uh, from the, the Crusades, uh, which is also kind of normal considering that in the West we did have um, horse archers, mostly crossbow at this point, uh, but of course there is nothing strange about anyone, uh, say, that having enough training. The noblemen did it all the time, like fighting, like shooting um, with a bow from uh, horseback. Right, it's really uh, a match also about oh wow, the head horse are yeah. I mean, what's strange about having a horse archer also in the west? It's not that if something is non typical, it's something impossible that must forcefully entail like some external injection. That's not how it works. Like, it, 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 it means to have an incredibly poor idea of human intelligence, which also you know does not flatter one owns when holding such views. So let's pass to all this series of um, mostly iconographic evidence, there's some archaeological one more strictly manked here and there, regarding mostly the this the influences. Let's um, like this is you know in this series the the actual light motive, like if we don't look much at the, at the backbone of, of these forces are also sort of well known in their essence, but rather that, but with the kind of uh, factors like of allogen influences that we were uh, described. There is an interesting set of coins from the county of Odessa. Uh, here, the 
most fascinating ones are actually the ones of Baldwin II. So we're between between eleven ten and eleven eighteen. These are these coins are preserved at the uh, National Library of Paris in the Cabinet de Medaille, and they display this sort of um, say mixture of earlier indigenous designs with say new Western European forms that are sort of typical of the Latin East. You you do actually find this in the numismatics of a bit like the entire uh, Ultramare, but the County of Odessa is more characteristic because it displays uh, perhaps some greater, uh, say, variety due to the influence of um, Armenian and Turkic Turkish um, proximity. Uh, the it's sort of difficult to explain now in, in practice with how that would be, but essentially there were sort of more competing uh, communities as well. These were areas that had, it is also much more like, as you know, on the northeastern frontier, so it's just more exposed in the first one. In fact, it's the first um, one to, to fall, really. And in this case, Baldwin the second count of Odessa has, for example, like a very European type of helmet with a forward angled crown. Yet, uh, his armors and the sleeves are peculiar. Um, admittedly, these coins are not incredibly precise because they say that the, the designs are uh, crude. And also, time unfortunately wears um, the, me the metal out uh, a bit. But, um, we do not really know whether we're looking at a male Holberg or actually a sleeveless cuirass of the lamellar type that would have been, in fact, more similar to the Middle Eastern style. Unfortunately, from the art, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to get in the first place. And there is another coin from the same Baldwin uh, II. The source is always, like, um, the same for these. Um, that also show us like a short-sleeved garment. This is also sort of typical of the Syria, Jazeera, um, uh, Iraq. Uh, it could represent um, like, like a male Holberg. Um, we did, we're not sure of probably the, the type of, of, of armor. Uh, and uh, this, again, was something more typical of the lighter forms of um, armor, especially of Turkic influence. That at this point, albeit as we explained, like was sort of, especially in Lebanon, sort of a analogen element, were the ones of the sort of ruling elite, right? Uh, the one that would rule over the sort of more urbanized sanitary element, like locally, and because they had sort of dynastic, chivalric, feudal, right, equestrian bias coming from Central Asia through Iran, right? That, that was the thing. Um, on this coin, what is really interesting is also how small the shield is, um, especially for the early 12th century, because, as you know, in the 13th, the, the Western shield gets smaller because armor gets uh, sounder. You do not really need that. But at the time, it's rare. And considering the place, a Byzantine-Armenian influence is likely, right? We do not really find either the uh, type of um, headgear uh, in the in the panoplies of, of the time. Not even locally, I think it's probably a hat right, of sort and uh, God knows why Baldwin wanted to be represented like this. Then we have a coin of Raymond of Poitiers that was Prince of Antioch uh, with a depicted the, the, the source is also the same from the Cabinet de Medaille. Uh, there is a simple helmeted head. Um, the helmet has a nasal, a cross painted on the side. Like this was actually also one of the more likely means of recognition, like the, the Crusaders uh, uh, among the other fighters. A male Oberk um, is worn but ending at Raymond's shoulders which is also very, again, Eastern uh, in style. Uh, the helmet is 
a round low dome type that is possibly also in fact uh, eastern influence. Yet another coin of Baldwin the second showing a uh, Holberg or Quirras and also in this case we do not understand whether it's uh, sleeveless or not. He has a broad tapering sword in his hand which um, is like an important indicator of anti-armor capacity. It's sort of a western thing like the guy would come from the, the areas in which the tapering design was sort of more used in, um, in western Eurasia in the first place. I think possibly anywhere else because of the high concentration of armor in the feudal system um, of, the, of the Frankish world. Um, and we see a war hat of the brim type which is actually very similar to the one that the Armenians, the, the Byzantines depict in their art, like the Crusaders themselves would have sort of started using it, especially later on as sort of uh, armor was increasing also in, say, in uh, weight for the lighter elements such as the squires, this, this sort of the sergeants, etc. We, we saw them also as far as the Jerusalem and uh, recruitment um, documentation is, is concerned. And we have a coin of Richard, Lord of Marash, it was a locality within the Principality of Antioch. This dates to the early 12th century. Again, Cabinet de Medai, Paris. Um, this um, place was on the northernmost frontier. Uh, as a consequence, Armenian and Byzantine influences are um, pretty much similar just to the ones we noticed for Edessa. Right? We have a conical helmet, a sword, a relatively small kite-shaped shield, and uh, that design was also a thing, as you know, um, among the Byzantines and the and the Saracens. Um, it's just like the sizes on average that, that changed it tended to be smaller. In fact, like in this case, we see sharply angled upper corners in the shields that make it even less Western European. Uh, we do not have an idea of whether this developed in that way because of some sort of internal western thing or because of these other Byzantine or other eastern influences. It's also like impossible to tell. Now we have a seal of Geoffroy de Bouillon that was the Advocatus Sancti Sepulcri. So this is from Palestine dating between 1099 and 1100. Um, it's, um, it's depicted in Prower, the Histoire du Royaume Latin de Jerusalem. Seals are a better source than coins because they're bigger, right? And uh, as such, they're normally also more detailed. Um, and as you know, military costume is often well represented on these because they depicted the authority that issued them uh, also in his full might as a, as a, as a fighter. And Jufra here wears a conical helmet that's very, again, uh, European, but it has an interesting extension uh, protecting his neck, which is, is not really like necessarily an Eastern thing, but it was a common thing as well there. And we can't understand better much how it's made. He has a spear, presumably a kite-shaped shield, right? Here, just a, some detail that is possibly maybe something more eastern looking. We have a seal after Schlumberger from the uh, Silographie de l'Orient Latin. This was a, 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 a depicting a Viscount of Nablus. So again, Palestine, we're in the 12th century. And if anything, what is interesting here is their large round helmet worn by the by the, the horseman that is uh, maybe again just a misdepiction some sort of poetic license who knows we have the seal of a lord of Marash dating to the 12th century this comes from the cabinet de Medaille we are again in northern Syria that distinguishes itself because of its greater variety uh, from the more homogeneous uh, southern ultramar states 
Bitcoin age, we see a bareheaded man. Um, this is interesting because normally, like, there wouldn't be, you know, just like people going to war like that. Um, the there is in any case an armor that covers only his chest. We don't understand exactly what type it is, but considering that this just covers the chest and the abdomen, this could be a lamellar cuirass, as the many that were used in in the Byzantine Empire, in Chilish Armenia, and in the various Muslim states. Uh, it was just a, a lighter, like sort of more, um, like just in that form, not like the Holberg that goes down the, uh, the waist, etc. Like so, uh, it was a more compact type of armor for some sort of lighter type of combat. We have um, some carved capitals from Nazareth dating to the late 12th century. This is preserved at the Historical Museum of Nazareth in Israel. And the um, interesting aspect of this is that they are influenced by some French, um, uh, say, craftsmanship. Probably an Occitanian style. There are some demons represented in these capitals that basically were meant to represent from the crusader side some infidels and so um, some sort of more monstrous um, uh, say creatures of sort that would partly reflect the, the Islamic uh, equipment. There is one shield, for example, with an angle front that is very reminiscent of the later Spanish adargas um, that, as you know, are this sort of like almost uh, kidney-shaped type of shields for lighter troopers, like you see it for the Zinetes, uh, etc. We'll be talking about them uh, somewhat soon. Uh, there is also a similar but more straightforward shield used by a demon that um, is trusting with a fairly broad-bladed spear. It could be connected with the, um, let's say, necessity of like the, this lighter... Um, uh, warfare to just try to cut more rather than simply uh, trusting the process because of less armor involved. The Westerners on our age had more. That could be one uh, reason. Another re uh, demon is using a recurved composite bow. However, he's using the Western finger draw, not the thumb one that is more typical of the Middle Eastern Turco-Iranian uh, archers, which may be a mistake, just like the maybe the the Occitanian artist knew just the it was not particularly into military technicalities, knew just that draw, right? And so yes, represented some something maybe uh, he was told to represent in that way, but this detail had been forgotten. Now this is very interesting. Um, we have an ivory cover of uh, the so-called Queen Melisande's Psalter. So this is the M Melisande um, uh, is the the queen of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, right? Um, this ivory cover dates uh, to, in fact, Palestine, the early 12th century. It's preserved at the British Museum of London. On this cover, you see Goliath, uh, pride slain by humility and fortitude slain avarice. The arms and armor depicted um, is quite um, fascinating and it's possibly reminiscent, as we will see now, of a specific uh, cultural influence. For example, Goliath and Pride seem to be armored in Byzantine fashion, which could have something to do with the fact that currently the Crusader Byzantine relations were fairly, say, at least non conflictual. They, they never really liked one another, but one thing was properly quarreling, and the other thing is, okay, we're cool after all. Um, there is a degree of stylization and archaism as well. Um, this, the armor, for example, seems to be of made of male jerkins with splinted upper arm protections of sort. 
pride is depicted in the most Byzantine way possible, sort of uh, fascinating considering the, the prejudices that the Franks had towards um, especially Byzantine emperors, like sort of embodied that uh, level of pride of haughtiness um, towards them. Um, pride has a splinted skirt, a helmet with some form of non-male aventail, a sword hung from a guiche, a small round shield, and again it's very Byzantine after all, in spite of, of the blend. Uh, Goliath is less Byzantine, maybe more Islamic, um, Islamically conceived. We see a uh, male shirt with a uh, coif for him. This may be extended for, beneath his kilt, by the way. While the kite shaped shield, pretty large, uh, is rather Western European. Now, the most fascinating figure is Fortitude, however, because this was, of course, the symbol normally you would see on a Psalter to be the typical Christian Western hero, so reflecting some degree of Westernness in his equipment, um, in her equipment, rather. Uh, and um, yet, you see a lamellar cuirass. Um, we see something similar in Norman Southern Italy at roughly the same time, the early 12th century, so it's possible that, of course, like, especially the, um, the, the Crusaders were closer, like, also to, to that um, Levantine world, you know, Sicily was the launching uh, path, let's say, from, for the, from, uh, from its ports uh, to, the, to the Holy Land, and the local Siculo Normans had the sort of more Byzantine Islamic influence in their arms and armor. So that could be maybe reminiscent of that, it could be a, a similar dynamic showing us this fortitude in lamellar armor on this uh, ivory collar. And again, this is the Queen's one, however, so there is surely something more, like it's not an accident. Um, because the lamellar would have fit better some sort of at least Eastern uh, protagonist of sort. And the hypothesis that has been presented is that this would actually represent an Armenian prototype because the Queen Melisande was actually Morphia of Melisande, daughter uh, to uh, Gabriel, an Armenian uh, prince. Um, thus, maybe wanting to bring her Armenian sort of uh, touch uh, also in arms and armor influence, uh, how many times she would have seen her father uh, with a lamellar armor, like in that more Eastern style. Um, and so it's possible that, um, given also that the Queen was uh, very um, good at improving the relation between the Catholic Crusaders and the local Armenians, as well as the other you know Christian communities living in the Kingdom of Jerusalem, that this... Um, was actually like a deliberate choice, um, hinting, in fact, at her uh, Armenian contribution to, to the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Then we have paintings on columns uh, in the Basilica of the Nativity of Bethlehem that date shortly after the Crusader conquest. We have two figures. One is purely Byzantine, in character. It has a deeply convex round shield, uh, so that sort of politic uh, style, one uh, typically as archaic sort of Roman classical looking armor that the military saints wear in the Byzantine art. The other one, however, is more, uh, let's say, interesting to say the least, because um, it may actually represent specifically um, either Knut of Denmark, or St. Olaf of Norway. And it's rendered, at least, in a more sort of Western style. For example, we have a decorated kite-shaped shield. And this is interesting because uh, especially some saints were could be already very international, but we could think literally of a Scandinavian crusader that sort of had, had something to do with this 
Lazar's guy the depiction. Um, now, the Queen Melisande's um, south there is not just interesting for the ivory culver, but also because of the actual uh, illuminations present. Uh, we have this preserved uh, the in this uh, specific manuscript, they there were copies of it naturally. Um, the Egerton 1139 uh, preserved at the British Library of London, um, the illuminations of which are very illuminating, right? We see we are between 1131 and 1143 uh, in this case, um, and we have uh, this quite distinctive Euros there is, uh, in fact, a heavy Byzantine influence, largely, that sort of, like, uh, golden backgrounds and sort of particularly stylized uh, figures. There may even be some sort of local influence strictly meant uh, from the Levant next to the say, tiny but consistent amount of uh, Western European Romanesque uh, influence. There is... Um, uh, a scene in the in the gardens of the Gethsemane uh, depicting among the, the guards come to arise, uh, to arrest uh, Christ and his uh, disciples uh, an, uh, an interesting array of weapons is one of those scenes that in uh, Christian art often show us this sort of pole arms, so you see mostly just the uh, the blades on the top. And this is quite interesting because the type of weapons here are likely of, say, Byzantine, Armenian, or Syriac um, origin. So showing us what we don't see very much otherwise because these places did not really have that enormous, uh, as we were saying before, sort of municipal bias like the... Um, they were ruled, like in this case, by uh, by some feudal overlords. And in this case, however, decide like to represent at least part of that. And of course, there is some Western influence. We have to presume we don't we don't really know. But the weapons are fascinating. We see, for example, a sort of knife or dagger, uh, round-headed and spiked maces. The latter really not very uh, Western European uh, at all. Spears, there's a long-bladed axe with a hammer at the back, which is interesting because it uh, reinforces yeah, probably an anti-armor weapon, some sort that would have been useful against some armored opponent, but used by some infantrymen rather, which is not what you immediately think when you look at Levantine warfare at this time, nor ever, frankly. There are other very unusual weapons. One, for example, sort of a pointed warhammer. Another is a war flail of sort, and this um, latter weapon would not be uh, particularly widespread until the 14th or the 15th century in general. So we often saw like some precursions, maybe by accident, not because these weapons had to be the future, these areas were particularly more advanced, but certain solutions again in very you know practical mechanical sense would have obviously been produced already from from quite some time. Uh, you can think these weapons to be used against the horse's legs um, could be an idea after all in Palestine, the main foes also like from the outside. Would have been horsemen, so that that's that's a possibility. The guards sleeping outside the holy sepulcher are basically Byzantine, right? They're in part uh, sort of accurate for the times, in other ways instead very archaic according to the Byzantine uh, stylems. There are two archers. We see them using early forms of composite bows with angled grips. Both the bows and one man's quiver on a strap over his shoulder, however, are sort of more similar 
to a Mediterranean um, context than um, a Middle Eastern one, in part again because we said that the Levant was technically more uh, sedentary, like uh, the gear of most, say, again, Middle Eastern warriors was something more sort of equestrianly based. We have a Syriac gospel, we do not really know from where, possibly the Principality of Antioch, dating to the late 12th century. It is the manuscript uh, 01.02 at the University Library of Cambridge. There are different, um, say, information suggesting the, the northern crusader, uh, crusader state's origin. Right. Uh, we see Joshua's body armor and legs depicted in the very Byzantine fashion that, however, would have not really reflected the reality uh, of the times. Joshua's sword is broad, non-tapering, so it's very sort of local because there is less armor around and more to chop lighter forces. Um, the round tip as well is very... Um, uh, telling about that, and even though the latter characteristic is very sort of Byzantine and Mediterranean uh, to an extent, um, the wall figure here is, seems to be more, say, the uh, of the sword is uh, more Arab or Middle Eastern. The scabbard is Byzantine or Levantine. The helmet is very that is one piece in construction is very European otherwise it's conical with slightly forward angled uh, crown on, on, on top um, there is a second helmet that may be both like sort of Mediterranean or Middle Eastern in some way the same can be said of an axe uh, spear and a second uh, sword and you can imagine on that frontier these styles actually being there, and of course consider that we are in a pre, not just a pre-industrial time, but say that the level of standardization of weapons is not particularly high, especially like this is just a an iconographic source, right, so we can't imagine the, the various artistic licenses, but just the possibility that everything could be personalized, customized, uh, also in the material reality. We have some armor fragments from Kurain, which is the castle of Montfort, dating roughly to the 70s of the 13th century. This is preserved at the Metropolitan Museum of Art of New York, and uh, it's part of a broader ensemble of arms and armor that were left at some point by the crusaders in the castles they, they abandoned, uh, and or that, I mean, they weren't just the ones that had would just leave, but they had been stored there, you know, um, sedimenting, etc. We know that we are in pretty late in time. We know one fragment belongs to a great helm, which is fully fitting uh, the time. Um, we also have some other fragments of coat of place, which, however, may come from a sort of an early form of jack, like some or some scale cuirass. Um, when you look at these, so something lighter than the, the coat of plates that normally, say, the European knights used at this point. And so when you look at all these fragments um, as a wall, they actually look something different from a strictly Western European thing. There, is, there are many similarities, for example, with Eastern Europe, even with Russian armor that, as you know, had been actually getting a big deal of influence from the West, like importing um, some blades and, and armor and, and granity adapting to the local warfare. At this point, consider that the Mongols, however, are, are also still around, so there is a lot of influence of that sort. In any case, we can imagine some sort of lighter type of warfare, especially at this point why the Kingdom of Jerusalem was uh, falling apart, and so maybe, of course, like some knight would have had the, the top panoply available, but if they were just locals on average, um, 
they would have tried to, to make some economy and also because the local warfare would, was that lighter and so needing more flexibility uh, of some sort. And uh, speaking of the Russian connection, um, the sort of more logical connection one could draw is Constantinople. This still, however, in 1270 has withdrawn a little bit, you know, in, in all this, but they're still still communicant, of course, with this area uh, after all. Two of these are of tank type that, as you know, is more like from the steppe influence. There are some interesting finds of this catapults also from the same roots, like at the time of the Mongol conquest, we do not understand who's who there um, in terms of artillery, but the tank type in this case is rather similar to late 12th century uh, crossbow bolts from the Middle East. Uh, and it could be, again, that they were just used, as we were saying, by different peoples at the same time. Right. Um, yet we do not have an overwhelming amount of data, the, the general, like, complete picture of how, like, this crossbow bolts re really were in the surrounding regions and how many varieties existed. We have an enameled sword pommel from either Syria or Palestine dating to the 13th century, also preserved at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, this is decorated in a basically Middle Eastern style, except for a heraldic shield in the center. It's possible that the local craftsman, that are, it was surely a local, it was a Syrian, um, likely, would have created this pommel for a European customer, regardless of his location, that is still in a crusader context, um, or not, right? Um, I also made a video about the Mamluk rank emblems that sometimes are similar to the Western ones, but they're slightly different uh, in nature. In any case, we are in the 13th century, like uh, the Crusader states are gradually falling right in their core. We have weapons from the uh, Pilgrim's Castle of Athlete. This was uh, in the Kingdom of Jerusalem. This weapons date to the late 13th century, and they can they were documented by Johns in the quarterly of the Department of Antiquities of Palestine, volume number five, number one in uh, in um, uh, 1935. This is especially the figure number 15, page number 50. Um, this was a Templar castle, and um, this was just essentially on the Palestinian coast. These are crusading weapons, but there is an interesting uh, influence from the others. For example, there's a massive spearhead. He has three small tank-type arrowheads. Too. So you can imagine, of course, the crusaders using you know, some type of um, local construction of arrows as well. Um, the flatter to um, uh, that we, we see, uh, say, among them are more Mamluk looking than Crusader. There is a substantial axe head uh, with a particularly thick blade. Um, this was perhaps just like a working tool, not a weapon. Um, in any case, the prototype um, in, in origin would have been a half crescent, uh, which, um, say, it's also similar again to some as you know, local, especially Islamic um, weapons. We've seen it for, for the Mamluks. We'll keep looking at them. Think about the Tabardari, etc. Then we have um, the carved marble tympanum of Larnaca in Cyprus, dating to the first half of the 13th century, preserved at the Victorian Albert Museum in London, though. This displays like a, a practically perfect European military panoply. The only different uh, feature, and not even so pronounced, is the fact that none of the armored 
characters are wearing surcoats. All right. Now we see uh, two sleeping guards outside the Holy Sepulchre with the tall conical helmets without nasals. This is uh, slightly archiving, perhaps. Um, we see Quaff, in one case, Mel Schoss. I uh, see two soldiers at the crucifixion with the same armor, but they don't have helmets. Also, their hauberks lack mittens. The idea is that in the East, things would have gone again lighter. A bit because of maybe this imperfect feudalism and or because of the lightness required to fight in a more uh, dynamic uh, context, tactic. Um, the swords are straight. Uh, at least in one case, uh, one is non-tapering, which again would be fitting a bit more this Mediterranean, uh, like more lightly armored dimension. The Byzantines at the time did not use surcoats. Right. Uh, we do not know what uh, the artist here was was taking as a model. Right. Um, so there was also like considering this biblical scenes, not even a clear idea whether this type of armor is supposed to represent an enemy proper, right, or something like I don't know, Longinus, for example, that is not here really at least uh, meant to be distinguished or recognized. It, naturally Cyprus had been Byzantine for, for a long time, had been first taken by Richard of England and at this point there was another French uh, dynasty as you know ruling in there but surely the, inf the cultural influences were quite strong. It was not a western country in the way we intended culturally and ethnically. Speaking of the latter uh, Cypriot dynasty, we have engraved monumental slabs of the royal Lusignan family. Um, these are preserved in the Limassol Historical Museum of Cyprus. We do not know exactly where they come from. Likely, however, I mean, surely Cyprus, but the, like from the possibly the Hagia Sophia mosque that had been a cathedral uh, back in the day in Famagusta. We're talking about late 13th, early 14th centuries. These tomb labs are uh, slightly lesser known, but they are revealing about the Latin Eastern panoply. Both figures are wearing hauberks with internal male gloves they have individual fingers, so it's actually a very uh, advanced form of, let's say, of, of hand armor reflected by the royal status. Um, there is perhaps a stiff undergarment raising the necks that may have been fastened to it. The quaff, however, are clearly separate pieces. Um, there is some padding or semi-rigid cuirass worn beneath the heraldic surcoat um, that have also squared shoulders. One figure has still like plated leg hardness, which um, matches with the substantial heaviness of this. At nights, um, we see knee uh, covering polanes, greaves, covering, however, just the the front of the shins and male shows are water underneath so they're very handy guys the swords however are fundamentally different from the one of west uh, ones of western europe one is long from a baldric um, rather than from a sword belt it's also while straight non-tapering which Else, I don't know, these guys were for chopping more people than trying to thrust into their armor. It's, it's a possibility. Consider that the Mamluks would try to storm Cyprus at, some, at a point. We'll make a video about that. Um, there is also some um, Italian influences, right? That sort of makes a lot of sense given the 
the omnipresent Italian um, activity uh, in and around places like Cyprus, but that's just like a touch. We have a manuscript, d'histoire universelle, produced within the, the Kingdom of Jerusalem around 1287, now preserved at the uh, National Library of Paris. This is the uh, French manuscript uh, 20,125. There are different scenes, um, including quite interesting, uh, say updated, but also ar more archaic uh, items. Oedipus, for example, is represented with a round helmet, a small nasal, and limited male shows covering neither the calf or his leg nor his heel. So relatively light, really, for especially considering the times, like we are in the end of the 13th century, you would think of, generally speaking, a, um, a heavier equipment there. I made a video, by the way, based on these um, manuscripts about the Crusader infantrymen of the 13th century, so if you're interested in that, um, like uh, the, the, there is evidence drawn also from these sources. Polynices and Thaddeus have two forms of great helm. One is more moderately round top, the other is instead the flat top variety. They have both crests. Um, the flat top great helmets are essentially being represented in ways eventually to to develop, in fact, the domed ones that are you know, sort of work in progress, of course, from the side of, of the altar. But it was the same time which things were gradually changing in some, uh, in some uh, also military context. We see uh, some padded or perhaps scale covered crease with round knee covering planes for the uh, riders. In the scene in which Hector is slaughtered by Achilles, there is a very gruesome depiction of the spear thrusts uh, in the upper thigh of the victim um, above the top of his male shoes. Whatever there is some presumed Islamic sort of model uh, for a certain figure, um, we see curved sabers plus some other objects that some people may confuse with maces, but they aren't maces. We do not understand what they are. They may be actual nafta, mm, say explosive, uh, or just incendiary pots uh, with long necks. That's sort of maybe for throwing. Um, who knows? Uh, we know that the Mamluks at this point made use of that stuff and made a video about the uh, the the various guns that they were starting the the meat fuzz that they were starting to toy with, um, but this doesn't look like that either. That would have a stick and sort of like um, the incendiary uh, devices uh, at the top. Alexander's soldiers are depicted fundamentally as Westerners, especially for their armor. Uh, if it wasn't for the small round buckler that may have been connected with either the way, I don't know, they thought maybe Alexander's uh, sorry, software he may have actually looked like um, and or some infantry uh, style that maybe existed in Ultramar for, for the infantry. It was surely, like especially in the in the ethnic um, local tradition lighter than the western one. We see oval shields used by crusaders, interestingly enough, which is smaller than the typical shields uh, infantry would use at this point that were sort of like also tending to be ever more um, like uh, covering, right, enveloping as well, um, or in or particularly flat or large. Right, so we do not understand exactly what, like there were 
certain oval designs even in areas that had sort of much bigger shields all right there are different traditions that all have them in different contexts like the islamic the byzantine the balkan and the italian one there is uh, a soldier of alexander's army wearing what seems to be a broad brimmed hat over his male coif which could be a chapelle de fer but the irregular lower edge uh, doesn't make it uh, apparently so uh, something is possible as a real hat right something that appears also in islamic iconography at the same time because think about just the sun in this especially season contact like they could need that for the local climate Olio Furness seems to be wearing pollens on his knees um, a soldier in his army has a helmet with a rather broad chin strap we have an history of Outremer from the French uh, National Library uh, Paris the French manuscript 9084 this comes from the kingdom of Jerusalem dating to 1286 there are many of the history of Outremer that are sort of the most especially like in the 13th century uh, depicting like the the history in fact of the crusaders uh, like here this manuscript is apparently from a school of acre so these were the guys that literally was the last main avant post and there was all a great deal of course of connection with with the west but we find again the oval round shield right um that uh, as we've seen it was present also in the previous uh in the previous sources uh we shouldn't think that uh this is just a uh, artistic license it's likely true that the crusaders were equipped more lightly compared to uh, which is even interesting because it shows you how mobility for them was more important than protection apparently even against enemies that normally shot the hail of arrows against them and we talk in that video about the 13th century crusader infantrymen also about the effectiveness of armor just just per se it was increasing in in weight as you know exactly at this point we see in the illustrations of war with a brimmed uh, chapelle de fer war hat um, which is actually the same identical size of the supposed sun hat that we have seen uh, before um, islamic forces are represented accurately with turbans maces small round shields so they are uh, render typically like this one archer has a hat or an iron war hat with a square top others have point helmets um, there's a variety of angled crowns we see male in one case also lamellar we have another history of Ultramare uh, preserved at the Bibliotheca Laurenziana of Florence this is um, the uh, manuscript um, for their um, 66.10 this dates uh, from 1290 1291 it's also preserved it's also I mean made uh, uh, in um, in the kingdom of Jerusalem we see again something again similar about this crusader warfare the great helms are all domed not a uh, very round topped uh, no flat ones or, or flat top ones are found we see mostly however chapelle de fer war hats which um sort of fits the sort of the lighter type of warfare that we're thinking also maybe because of climatological reasons um we see um male coifs alone sometimes which sort of was part of the same reason we think uh, shields are again either oval or round mostly at least there are also the triangular type uh, flat topped um, attached um, to the side of the galley for uh, in one illustration for example crossbows are common in this um, history of Ultramer illustration um, and that 
probably also tells a lot about what the actual war, but especially in a siege context, of course, really was. We see um, an axe, so a sort of big axe that was used to undermine a fortress. Um, there is an archer uh, in naval warfare, which is interesting because, of course, uh, even though the crossbow had sort of taken over, like there would be such kind of bowmen uh, as well. There's a very beautiful counterweight trebuchet depicted, and again, by this point, uh, it would have been really, uh, really very calm. Another history of Ultramare, uh, actually fr from the same uh, from the same years, like 1287, preserved at the Municipal Library of Boulogne, manuscript 100. 42, um, we see actually very accurate portrayal of uh, Christian panoply uh, of the time, thick blades, um, we see uh, Islamic sabers as well from the other side, it's correct, um, we see a standard bearer of uh, Godefroy de Bouillon wearing a war hat, Two of the Crusaders in Antioch carry oval shields, again, other hint of that format. This is interesting because it's not so immediately um, sort of um, relatable, especially if you consider that there were at this point pretty big type of defense, large extended type of defense is all importantly large shields uh, in other contexts in which a lot of missile fire was present. Think about the, the Italian Pavis. That is not yet um, there actually in the larger form. But the fact of, again, Indies having this oval round shields is mostly stressed the dynamism of the troops as opposed to some sort of passivity against the, uh, the Arabs. You couldn't explain it otherwise, right? So, so we're talking about the aggressiveness of the Westerners. They would have been tra able to chase the enemy in so many ways. We have uh, an Histoire Universelle produced in 1286. Again, these are all years. Um, I don't know, perhaps because they were being produced just before Acre fell, and so they arrived all at the time, were preserved, treasured more. Uh, I don't know about the codicological, sort of phylological um, implications here. It's preserved at the British Library. Uh, and we see here some uh, war against the Amazons, so like of the ancient um, Greek uh, sagas. Uh, this manuscript is from Acre. There is a quite a mix of Frankish, Byzantine, and Islamic styles, both in both artistically and in the actual elements of panoply that are uh, depicted. We see the Scythian women heavy, um, actually the Scythian women's menfolks heavy cavalry representing the flat top great helms. I can't find a specific reason why the great helm should have remained more flat top, perhaps because it was less slashing from the top compared to Western Europe? I, I don't think so. Or maybe something more, you know, anti arrow which also wouldn't make sense in this context. Maybe it's just about the fact that uh, at this point, the uh, by the 13th century, this uh, crusader enterprise was seen as more desperate. And so there was mm, perhaps also, as we've seen, like the system had been broken. There was less availability of... Uh, updated panoply rather than else. That's the only reason I can think concretely why this type of great helm is still there. But it's also a transitional phase within the same Europe. We see some sappers, infantry of sort with axe, big axes. Uh, because it's a siege uh, scene to some extent. We do not understand clearly the intention of, of the soldiers, but um, the defenders have bows, crossbows, an axe, rocks, which is also pretty uh, realistic actually for even sometimes very advanced uh, siege warfare. They wear male hauberks with or without mittens. They have uh, brim chapelle de fer war hats, uh, 
uh, they there are also also this close fitting round helmets they're made in two pieces joined along the crown uh, we see some sort of stiff inner scale covered collar um, um, uh, worn by a defender there are other sort of similar types in the illuminations the same manuscript and they recall us something that we have already seen in late 13th and 14th century Byzantine and Balkan art and we connected it to the fact that the Turks were starting to swarm into the Balkans from different uh, also like from from the steps there was also Mon Mongol stuff around it so the idea is that you have to cover your neck with um, in order to cope with that um, archery and so reflect on we said before also in the smaller shields that after all those same peoples used and uh, and still the idea that the westerners had heavier armor and so maybe these uh, crusaders before the fall of uh, Ultramare um, uh, to the to the Mamluks uh, were sort of increasing their protection against this kind of arrow because as we've seen the Mamluks also were influenced by uh, Mongol warfare. We talked about the Wafidiya, these sort of uh, exiles that came uh, to, like, for even from places like north of the Caucasus, etc., uh, enemies of the Ilkhanate, um, as Mongols themselves that were to be settled properly on the Syrian frontier. So that may be something in common that exists with the Balkans. Um, at this point, the Serbs have very much as they lived uh, very much of an era in which many horsemen came out to be bottled, like the up the, from the steppes in the Danubian Valley. The Byzantines were very much exposed to the Turks themselves, uh, and so on. Um, we see clubs and maces, uh, perhaps with a knobbed iron head. Um, there are strong Byzantine elements in Nimrod's uh, forces two guardsmen um, and another figure have splinted upper arm protections in one case seemingly uh, fastened to a coat of plates which has rivets onto the chest we see an important degree of armor and anti-armor capacity as well uh, especially like when we see infantry or sieges and so on so representing actually heavier troops um, in general so just from the stories we see mm, in another case like a splitted uh, splinted arm protections fastened to a second mill uh, jerkin so something in this case lighter instead we see a long sleeved male alberg with mittens under perhaps a coat of plates there is a splinted skirt in the same figure as well which is somewhat archaic the male quaff is likely to have been separated um, another guard has quaff and collar but it's not made of mail interestingly enough and the both of them wear male shows anyway they, they have small round shields um, stressing that pattern we already observed uh, the brimmed helmets are similar but they're not made built in the same way the second guard has a tapering blunt tip and somewhat archaic sword a Greek or Trojan fighter has what seems perhaps a scale covered or splinted collar similar to that sort of neck protection we were talking about before um, in Europe, like this is yet also more similar one to types, at least based on this um, uh, iconography that would appear in early 14th century Europe as well. And again, for different reasons, there is not necessarily a connection for this, maybe just the increased level of missile warfare, but that's too vague uh, to tell. There's an Athenian fighter with um, the Byzantine typical, typically Byzantine upper arm protection. 
However, he has also long-sleeved male hauberk, small shield, um, very acutely tapering his sword, um, and apparently like some flat-top helmet or coif over some square arm arming cap. This is all very Western European, except again the small shield and the Byzantine stuff, which could be some sort of like, um, say, uh, could have some closeness to the actual look that a Western knight would have had in the last, you know, am posts of Ultramare, especially when I don't know raiding outside it was becoming ever more dangerous. But again, this lightness, this sort of adaptation. Um, to the local warfers is, is, would be really fascinating. Muslim influence is present as far as the thumb draw of, of an archer um, in a recurb, though uh, not much else actually. Uh, it, it's minority in any case. We have another Histoire Universelle from the Kingdom of Jerusalem dating to the late 13th century. This is preserved at the Municipal Library of Dijon. France, manuscript 562. Also here the style is European overall. The only exception to this are the Indians that are characterized um, by maces, small convex around shields, tirades bands around some sleeves, that as you know were some sort of means of recognition also by here they were not really meant to represent actual Indians of the late 13th century, but say this more Eastern kind of guys, like this, the Tiras was something more um, Middle Eastern in general. And there is also an emphasis on archery uh, for these guys that even if, again, it's like these Indians are conceived as Muslims, practically. Um, the same um, is true, for example, for the spear pennants or streamers of the Amazons. Uh, Alexander's men have the triangular pennons, in contrast to distinguish them. We have a mounted knight that is very much the typical uh, late 13th century European one. He has beautiful plate polains, the advanced form of uh, knee armor at this point. Um, infantry are mm, wearing surcoats. Uh, also with heraldically striped helmets. Remember that armor was painted um, in many ways um, and such distinction was sort of increasing by this point um, through these devices on, on the battlefields. We find one shield of the aforementioned oval type, the smaller uh, one that struck us. Um, another infantryman, ha and this for the infantry, like the other infantryman that we see here has uh, a basilar dagger in his hip. Uh, may not mean much, it's also a bit typical of this time. Uh, also, the way it's hung uh, from a belt by cords is mm, like, if anything, like a bit of an anticipation, if anything, of early 14th century sources, but may not have anything to do with an eastern link. Yet another history of Ultramare, around the, around 1280, from the Kingdom of Jerusalem. This is preserved at Saint, Saint Petersburg at the Saltikov Shredden State Public Library, uh, the French manuscript um, um, Folio Verses for five, right? Uh, what is impressive is really the concentration of manuscript we have from the time and the place, right? Or uh, dating to the to the last years of the Ultramare states. So from Acre, these are all from, they're recognizable because they are, they look all similar and they come from the school of Acre. That, was the more active also, manuscript production, as you understand, the last most important center. And in this case, we see actually a very good knowledge of Islamic panoply, which um, shows, for example, a large saddle cloth of a type found also in no parallel 13th century Frankish uh, sources, also in Europe proper. Islamic 
troops have this pretty heavy winged maces, they have round shields, turbans, what are seemingly conical helmets. Somewhere else they have fluted ones, brimmed hats, war hats, it was an important they were considered the were Westerners fighting among the Mamluks sometimes. So even after the fall of Acre as prisoners they were enlisted in in the Mamluk forces and they were in another. We see other typology male coif, you can imagine the, the variety also in, in reality. The Crusaders have male hauberks, integral mittens, male coif, male shawls, so the heavier uh, protection. Some have likely padded cus over their male shawls, so extra protection also from those damn arrows. Um, as we've seen, this is something that they may have just increased specifically as a Levantine tradition. We see Saint-Valier, the typical skull cup that sort of affirm, starts affirming it at this point. Um, we see the great helm, usually with a sort of angled front profile. Swords are tapering. A crossbowman is showed with maybe uh, an early uh, example of a loading hook in the, uh, on his belt. There are siege machineries. Um, one is a small man-powered mongrel mounted on a pole. Uh, it has attachment of three ropes. This had been around for really a, a long time, as you know. The other one is that it's much bigger, looks like um, having a loading from, from the front uh, instead. Um, one could uh, it's not really clear how this machine works, all right? Uh, possibly because it, it there is no beam sling, and so nobody and because the rest of the manuscript, as we've seen, is pretty neatly, it's pretty accurate, right? It re represents in detail like this kind of military uh, hardware, and so we we do not know either. We're looking at a torsion catapult of sort or the artist uh, did not really know how this machines really worked. And there is something similar to this, at least the closest resembling it, in uh, on an Iranian ceramic plate uh, of roughly half a century later, but I can't be really sure here again machine or siege machinery you have to make a video about that more videos about it uh, it was so varied and sort of uh, also um, ad hoc built and bearing that uh, could be really unique and in some kinds we don't have to forcefully find parallels right we just observed this because the guys were still in Asia maybe there was some kind um, of influence from, like in this case, what um, a Persian catapult. Who well, knows? Like the Westerners were like, very, very advanced uh, in warfare themselves. Like even the Persians had had, you know, an equivalent as they did. They they didn't have something like, especially in a smaller case, something more innovative or strangely different. Um, passing, at least in part, to Romania, we have the seal of Henry I, who was the Latin Emperor of Constantinople in the early 13th century. Uh, here we go back to the Cabinet de Medaille, where the seal is preserved. Um, and it's actually a very similar seal to the one of Baldwin I, right, that um, we haven't really discussed, but you can go check out if you, if you find it. Uh, online. Um, the sword tapers to a point. The hand is either unmailed or has a glove made of some different material. The shield is rather small, somewhat Byzantine kind of shape and type. Um, yet it's the helmet that also is sort of um, uh, 
interesting because it has a crest or plume and at this point it wasn't quite there in western european style so it's maybe like a byzantine or sort of archaic classicistic romanistic symbolism of sort this helmet also seems to display a chin guard around the face uh, it could even be helping the wearing of a face mask that was framed on it because you could have some leather frame over which you would attach eventually a mask right but we do not know really better it could just be a some artistic license but consider that these are seals so they are meant to be public as well so it's something that somebody else may have, somebody would have seen or would have understood in a relatively easy way uh, at the time right we do actually know something similar for 13th century western europe but they're so exceptional um, representations that also in those cases we do not really understand from the crudity of these seals or other sources what they are really supposed to mean right um, it's possible that um, there was an arming cap connected with this plume or crest but it's not really clear in the, in the picture we have the seal of John II of Ibelin, the Lord of Beirut, Count of Tripoli, dating to 1261. This is preserved at the State Archive of Venice. It's a um, seal from the, the county of Tripoli, Lebanon. The guy looks very European in this case. Uh, he has a flat-topped great helm um, with a single eye slit that, as you know, we're getting very thinner, that's why I hope. The entire facial protection had come to be like with the enclosed helmet. Um, uh, there may be here perhaps even a rectangular face mask, which I'm studying a seal, right, of a of a German count recently from a few decades later that you don't really understand very often from these seals what they actually are, whether it's just some sort of holes or some additional plate. On it for some sort. You have a surcoat um, from the pointed shoulders we may suggest some padding or semi-rigid curie, uh, le boiled leather worn beneath which uh, I mean boiled leather was an important thing especially at this time of substantial of growing French and German uh, Neapolitan Tuscan uh, Hegemony in the Mediterranean, like that, um, was also beginning to diversify a bit, specializing the types of troops. But in general, um, some areas had sometimes less precious metals considered that for, for local production. So, Kuyokuyi was another interesting uh, option and something lighter, something also um, less um, uh, sensitive to heat that matter. Uh, John's sword is tapering with a relatively acute tip which again points at that need to contrast heavier heavier armor mostly by western influence. We have an icon of St. George and we do not know whether it's from crusader art uh, or whatever but it's from Greece so um, this we don't know how it was commissioned for woman whatever it dates to the 13th century it's preserved at the byzantine museum of athens in inventory number 89. Um, this icon has different um, soldiers in passion scenes it has saint george um, and what we look at is essentially a byzantine uh, iconography like if you think even about the local soldiers like they're uh, we've seen it for the battle of Pelagonia as well like this feudal uh, this latin lords would have their own vassals as also like previous byzantine soldiers for the previous administration remaining in place um, but it's possible that um, we see a lot of western influence in this um, the byzantine forces in greece were normally lighter than 
the Western forces of the Crusaders. Um, we see uh, minor figures wearing, for example, the Chapelle de Fer war hat, short sleeved male hauberks, which, as we've seen, was not really typical of um, the Latin forces per se. We see a sleeveless male jerkin, a very light sort of, um, of male armor that, as we've seen, mostly existed in this sort of lighter context of just to protect the chest, the vital part, and then uh, leaving you more agile. It's gilded, by the way, and worn over the sleeved hauberk. Um, so in this case, it actually speaks of this multi-layer type of armor that, that did exist, right? And the Byzantine tradition especially was common, like to have this, um, say, different, say, it was common also for others, but uh, if in the Byzantine world you had to have different, uh, for heavier forces, multiple layers of metal armor, it would have been more likely to have the sleeves le uh, sleeveless things right over some uh, sleeved ones, right? Following that sort of uh, um, regress sort of a single chest piece. St. George's shield is very Latin and the saint has a blue painted short sleeved male oberg. It was rather common to paint armor at the time. In this case you have something again more like the short sleeved male oberg, uh, sort of in more slightly eastern guys, right? The ha then um, you can see under the cloak some sort of shorter brown painted garment with split sleeves. We do not know exactly what it is. It can be uh, a leather covered coat of plates. Um, we have no exact idea. We have an icon of St. Nicholas from the church of St. Nicholas this Stays. Um, from Cyprus dating to the late 13th century. It's preserved at the Macarius Foundation of Nicosia. St. Nicholas armor is male hauberk with finger mittens, male shawls, padded surcoat, squared shoulders. Um, it, next to the figure uh, you can see a, a symbolic rendition of what would be a great helm, which is interesting because uh, this did not belong to sort of Byzantine context, or rather you know, the, the, the cultural one. But here, of course, uh, you are in the Crusader Kingdom of Cyprus, and so it's a different story. Um, on the hand, we don't understand exactly what he's wearing, but it seems like a round helmet with a nozzle. We have some icons that we do not know whether properly coming from Crusader states, in any case dating to the 13th century, preserved at the Monastery of St. Catherine in Sinai um, in Egypt. Uh, now, aside from the, the saints that are somehow in that sort of traditional archaic type of armor, we notice that St. Theodore has a splinted or scale covered collar that is not seen in Byzantine art and we do not understand uh, exactly what, whether we can even attribute this to a crusader context which may have to do with the increase in um, like uh, enemy archery and the introduction of this sort of more uh, sort of experiments for better protection of the neck. Uh, the cuirass is a form of kilted armor. We have the icon of the Virgin Mary. Uh, this is from Crusader Cyprus, dates around 1300. It's preserved at the aforementioned Macarius Foundation of Nicosia. Uh, it tells the story of Dominican or Carmelitan uh, monks. In any case, we see here um, some arms and armor, 
they're very European, except that their kite-shaped shields are very small and they may be some sort of early Byzantine form of small round bucklers. We have an icon of St. Sergius from Crusader States, we don't know, know which ones, uh, but this time certainly uh, dating to the late 13th century at the aforementioned monastery of St. Catherine in Sinai Peninsula. Um, it, it's interesting because at least it is believed to have been made in one of the Crusader states, so at least there is a tradition supporting it. Um, and it's still, of course, Byzantine art. And uh, for the rest, it includes actually quite accurate uh, elements from the, the let's say, contemporary Levantine panoply. Consider that in this area, um, St. Sergius was uh, regarded as the patron saint by the local nomads, but still, as you know, lived in a bit of the fringe of civilization in, in these areas. Um, there had been a lot of raiding warfare, think about the caravans of, uh, you know, uh, attacked regularly. Uh, this place is proxy wars between crusaders and the Egyptians historically. We're in the late 13th century, it's another story. Um, the kingdom of Jerusalem had just been mostly disintegrated. So, uh, honestly, I, I don't know how this icon ended there. In any case, since Ser Serge's shield is round, he rides with a bent leg position, which, as you know, is a very Eastern type of riding, in spite of the fact that he has a um, high saddle with a raised cantle and pommel that are very Western. This is an interesting mix. Um, also, his archery equipment is very uh, Eastern, specifically Turkic. Um, so. Mamluk at this point, Egyptian in the sense, of course, that the Mamluks had imported a lot of stuff from the steppe. And in fact, this stuff could be uh, Mongol, even, in influence. We do not have to think that the artist really understood much in detail of these differences, but it's still quite, uh, let's say, wanted in rendition to see this, this stuff. Um, for example, there is no strap. Um, that would have been necessary to connect the upper rear side of the quiver to the saint's belt. There is a smoothly recurved bow in a bow case on the saint's left hip. Um, this would be a turcopo in many ways, and uh, s such depictions are very, very precious so for precious for uh, for us to understand what this hybrids that you understand could be also representing even sort of multi-task warriors like noblemen would have been able to fight like this too, like also the last crusaders of Ultramar would have been assimilating very much this kind of fighting styles. Going back to Greece we have the seal of Guy de la Tour that was at some point the titular king of Thessaloniki this dates to 1314, it's preserved at the Cabinet de Médaille of Paris. Uh, this guy was the son of Humbert I of Viennois. Um, he actually never went um, to, um, to Greece, even just to the, like, the acre had fallen at this point, but the seal was attached to a charter drawn up by the Catalan Great Company in Greece, because these uh, Iberian mercenaries, I made a video about them, Roger de Flore, etc., offered Guy the crown of the kingdom of Thessaloniki, uh, which um, in fact did not exist anymore, at least at that point. Um, now this is interesting because um, there are some styles here, do not know exactly uh, 
like here yes the these are catalans so they are sort of franks after all still um in greece making a seal for a western king and in fact guy is represented with a round top great helm apparently with a single broad islet um, mail is visible on his neck and arm that would normally have like plate armor at the, uh, this point um, and he has a large flat top shield which is a bit like maybe larger than the the ones that they would have normally used at this point the horse wears a caparison and this is pretty good depiction of what after all like a very well uh, armed uh, western uh, knight would have looked like in Greece at this point now from Venetian Crete dating to the early 14th century we have the wall paintings of the church of Panagia Kera in Crete. so as you know the, we never made a video about this but the Venetians of course ruled over Greece right and they had some sort of feudal system like they had a centralized governor and then there were some Venetian lords that did pretty much their own business in the interland so that at some point they tried even to rebel um, from the, the motherland all right, that was to escape taxes and this kind of stuff. Um, we see um, some interesting figures. Um, we see uh, armed, uh, for example, we see a typically Byzantine scabbard, uh, or this something that indicates some strong Byzantine influence. All right, you have flat broad and top instead of the usual cone shaped pyramidal outline that is uh, common among the Latins. Um, you see a very large shop, um, you see a figure carrying a primitive club, right, we do not know, sometimes art is weird, but we don't know exactly whether this was like, particularly Cretan in this context or or anything. Um, we have a funerary carving from Famagusta that um, is being lost, really, at least the uh, the the current location is unknown. A certain Mrs. Tiliano took some pictures of this, and this is interesting because, um, albeit again, it's a super old thing. Um, it's very, very, say, mostly Italian in style. It is again early normal. Um, the there is a a tall crest. Um, fastened to a great helm, a single broad eyes later so this looks like we are in the mid 14th century like they're the typical knightly um, equipment. Now for, of, of course of Latin um, provenance. We have St. George represented on the wall painting uh, of the church of St. George in the uh, Geraki castle or Geraki castle this uh, in Greece. This at the time was part of the Principality of Achaia. Uh, this um, painting dates to the 14th century. It's a very Frankish looking thing, uh, at least in the sword. Uh, and um, especially at this point, like as we were saying before, even the Byzantine world was really permeated by this stuff. Also the Balkans, right? And, and the the importance of course is that there were lots of at this point not even much French but uh, German and Northern Italian imports we've seen at the Battle of Pelagonia was the previous century how many Germans there were already there uh, through the Danubian um, Valley there would be some imports uh, but mostly came most of them came from Northern Italy it was very say, industrialized for medieval standards and they had the best arms and armor production of the time uh, Germany would have an increasing influence rather from the 15th century and there's a mix sometimes between Italian and Germany we've seen it in different uh, videos about in fact the bit slightly later medieval warfare then we have um, wall paintings really depicting again St. George however in um, Cyprus the church of Panagia Porbiotissa in Asino. We are in the 14th century. We see here just like the typical Byzantine style that would have remained in spite of the Crusader presence, of course. 
we see some riding boots or greaves covering the rider's legs. Um, there are there's some stiff material covering um, the legs, like in we do not understand exactly what how it's all composed by we see however very similar metallic greaves uh, in a Georgian Psalter in the late 14th or even 15th century here we are sort of exceeding the we'll keep exceeding with the last example like this our chronology the Psalter I'm talking about is preserved I think still at um, the Manuscript Institute, the Georgian Academy of Sciences in Tbilisi. It's the manuscript number A1665. Um, right. And interestingly enough, there are later 14th century Persian manuscripts that look uh, similar, this foot um, wear. Um, we do not know exactly here what's going on, but in the 14th century, as we've seen also in the video about Byzantine warfare, mm -hmm. uh, the regional outlook like this, uh, witness a very strong Islamic influence, especially through the Ottomans and other Turks from Anatolia. So, of course, the Caucasus was in between. I made a video about medieval Georgian warfare, and so we will keep also looking at that. Of it and you see these influences just are are always there and where in another you can't simply be picky about like oh my god there is a there is something similar between Iran and I don't know the uh, the Levant or even the Byzantines wow it, well it's kind of obvious right it's kind of uh, you know it would have been very normal if you had had the chance to look at one of these armies, you would have probably been amazed by the degree of influences, of mixes, of styles, etc. Even though there was still some sort of homogeneity, uh, after all, and so this is also uh, the interesting aspect that there is a functional basis for all this, and then you have the, um, the exceptions, the details, what escapes or not, and that's that's always, of course, very, very fascinating. Now, the last evidence is a way of the cross painted um, in the church of the aforementioned Panagia uh, Pro Biotissa in Asino. This is still Crusader Kingdom of Cyprus, right? We are between the 14th and the 15th century. We do not know much better also because the Byzantine style tends to be, as you know, flatter, right? Without, to say, much of an evolution uh, compared to say what was happening in the West um, we in fact it's a very traditional art um, in style in this case we see soldiers with male hauberks, maces spears you have avant tails on their helmets which is at this point like course a very Turkish or at least Islamic uh, thing right you, you have however slightly forward angled crowns you have small brims um, the officer has a lamellar cuirass his helmet has an almond tail but also a wider brim uh, which makes it look more like a chapelle de fer so it's interesting to see a chapelle de fer with an almond tail um, and uh, the shield is large and round, which is also not extremely typical at least for, for this time. And again, it's difficult to date this piece. Uh, there, there is something, of course, in common still with Byzantine art, even though maybe by this time, like the Constantinople was falling to the, or about to fall to the Turks. And so, you know, everything is. Uh, more mind-blowing like this kind of art that still sur survives the civilization of course that has created and, um, and that so this tells you a lot also in terms of what we looked at today it fundamentally was a crusader history but that as you understand has mostly this repeatedly lighter especially uh, shields Right, that's the thing that honestly uh, surprised, say not surprised me, but struck me the most. And um, 
like this general lightening of course of the fighters uh, equipment would have entailed of course some sort of greater mobility some sort of greater uh, I wouldn't say solo combat because of course like we know what um, the Crusader warfare really was was very uh, western like but looking at the adaptations is, is very fascinating locally. Plus there is the Kingdom of Cyprus that really has something a bit more... Um, not really adventuristic in itself, but it had not been established in a soundly sacral way like just during the, the First Crusade. It was a bit of a different thing. It stayed Byzantine for long. It was, um, let's say, going through sort of a slightly different history, had less direct Western influence. And even when you see the Lusignans were French, like you see, for example, the later Italian influence, you see that everything is still very much Byzantine. Uh, we've seen Greece that, uh, of course, maintains that. We've seen it mostly in Byzantine warfare, right? We've seen what it was about. The Byzantines were very influenced at that point, especially after 1204 by the same Latin and Turkish uh, styles. And there are some peculiar characteristics here and there. We see also some, for example, interesting in infantry weapons for the Ultramare militias that, again, would have not been so bad, actually, and that surely had, as we were saying before, some level of development um, on the Mediterranean given the progressed urban history of this, say, old urban history of these centers. And as I was saying in the beginning, I don't really think that there was much there that, say, the West was really getting from these places, um, if not secondarily in this sort of, um, say, detail, like the essence remains pretty much like the one that the, the conquerors kept using in Europe. Right, so there would have been a dramatic adaptation at some point to local size, but this doesn't mean that the West, in the sense, needed to adapt to those in Europe. Like it sort of uh, doesn't make much sense. But again, we will go on with the series because it's really, um, it's really an exercise as far as this diversity is is concerned. Uh, and uh, let's go by this. For today, however, I stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.